Welcome back to the Clean My Space channel. My name is Melissa Maker and I am an accidental cleaning expert, which means I hate cleaning, but I like to find the most efficient and effective ways to get the job done right the first time. And some cleaning jobs are really overwhelming. Like you don't know where to start. You're kind of dreading doing them but that's why I'm here. So what I've done is I've taken some of the most challenging cleaning jobs around your home and I've put them into this big supercut video so that you can see how to tackle these big jobs in easily broken down steps. And once you watch this video, you will learn that it's not so bad after all. You just have to know what to do. And just a quick reminder, if you haven't done so already to subscribe to the Clean My Space channel, and if you're interested in having some tangible material to teach you about cleaning, you can check out our very robust eBooks and printables section on our website. I'll put a link for you down below, or you can see it at cleanmyspace.com. Before we get into the actual cleaning segment of this cleaning video, I want to give you a quick rundown of that porcelain versus acrylic tub situation. Okay. So, the thing that you need to determine if your tub is porcelain or acrylic are some fingernails. They don't really have to be long. They just, they just have to be there. Go to the side of your bathtub and kind of tap it. If you get a metallic -y sort of reverb, like it sort of sounds if you're like, you're hitting something that's metal that tells you it's a porcelain tub. If you hit something that kind of sounds and feels plasticky, that tells you that's that it's acrylic or fiberglass. Now, what you have to know about these two, essentially acrylic or fiberglass, it's soft. It's kind of plasticky, so it's easy to scratch. That means you have to be careful with the cleaning products and tools and techniques that you use to clean your tub. So like we always say, like I always say, cause I'm the only one who does these clean my space videos. You always have to know your product, your tool and your technique before you get started so that you can clean efficiently and so that you don't ruin what it is that you're cleaning. If you're cleaning a porcelain tub or even a cast iron tub, which perhaps we'll cover in another video, the porcelain tub is much more durable. So you can use heavier duty products and tools and techniques when you're cleaning that. You can kind of pretty much throw anything at it and it should be okay. But acrylic, we're going to be a little bit more gentle. So we're going to go for non-scratch cleaning tools and we're going to go for a gentle scouring product like baking soda and we're going to use very gentle soaps and detergents. If you do need to restore shine or restore luster to your tub, you can even go to a home big box, sto big box store and pick up an acrylic polish and an acrylic cleaning product. I'm starting off with my Scotch Bright non scratch scrub sponge, the blue on blue. And then the products here, I've got dish soap, baking soda, vinegar, and a spray bottle. Then I've got some microfiber cloths here, just some general purpose, and then my ultra plush. Now what I'm doing is I'm just testing the scrubby side of the sponge on a hidden area of the tub to make sure that there's no scratching. I'm feeling and I'm looking. And I'm going to do the same thing for baking soda. I've just dampened my cloth there, put a bit of baking soda on, getting rid of the excess. And I'm just going to test again in a hidden area because if I do notice by looking or feeling any scratching, I don't want to use it. Now I'm going to remove everything from the bathtub. So in my house, that includes a lot of bath toys. A little pro tip here is to roll up your bath mat and use it as knee protection. Now here's a trick I learned years ago. I take my hand and I run it along the side of the tub and you'll see me do this around the full tub. Actually a blind client taught me this trick and by using my hand, I can feel the difference where the tub is smooth and where it's gritty. That's how I know where the soap scum is. Now, if you have just a little bit of soap scum, you can use some vinegar on a microfiber cloth and wipe it right off. But if you've got more, you'll want to mix up a solution of equal parts, vinegar and water, and then you can add about two tablespoons of dish soap. Shake that up and apply that to the surface by just spraying very liberally all over. You'll want to let this sit for a couple of minutes so that it can start to do its work on the tub before you actually start cleaning. You guys know how I feel about products. They should do a lot of the heavy lifting so you don't have to. Now I'm wetting my sponge and I'll start right at the top of the tub where that ledge is. Sometimes you get buildup from shampoo or soap bottles 
and I'm using the scrubby side of the sponge just to rub in all of that product. I expect it's done a lot of its work at this point, loosening and lifting the soap scum. So by using the S pattern, working my way from back to forth, top to bottom on the tub, I'm doing my best to get rid of as much soap scum as I can. Don't forget to get the base of the tub in that crazy little area around the drain. The outside of the tub is another area a lot of people forget about, but you will get soap scum buildup over time, so just make sure that you remember to do it. Now, another thing you wanna make sure you're not doing is rinsing before your tub is entirely clean. So what I'm doing here is I'm just feeling to see if all of that gritty soap scum is gone, and once it is, I know I can rinse. So what I'm demonstrating here is the method that you can use if you don't have a removable shower head to rinse your tub clean. I have one, but I decided I would demo this because in previous tub cleaning videos, we've been asked about that. So this is a jug here in Canada. That's where we put our milk. And I'm just using that jug to dump water all around the sides and the base of the tub. Then I'm using this ultra plush microfiber cloth, which is super absorbent to get rid of any excess moisture and that's gonna leave a really nice shine. I'm also finishing up by wiping the exterior of the tub with the same cloth. Kitchen counters really set the stage for the rest of your kitchen. If they're cluttered and dirty, Everything else looks that way, even if you've just spent an hour scrubbing and making the kitchen clean. So if you want your kitchen to look and feel clean, make sure that your counters certainly look and feel clean too. There is a multifaceted approach we need to take to this though. The first part is making sure that there's no visual clutter on your counter. You can see behind me, even when we're filming a video, we make sure there's not a bunch of clutter hanging out on the counter. We make it nice, neat, and tidy so that you don't have a lot of things that you have to look at. You just see this nice, clean kitchen. Now, the other thing to keep in mind with, with counters specifically are the stains and the crumbs. So you can do your eye level test, which I've talked about before. We get right down to eye level. You look straight on at the counter. You can see any crumbs and any stains and then of course you can just treat your counter with an appropriate cleaner for my kitchen i have granite counters now so i'll be using our natural stone all-purpose cleaner simple solution i can put the recipe link for you down below and of course you want to make sure that you're wiping any marks and stains off on a regular basis so that your counters look nice and clean when it comes to cleaning ceramic or porcelain tiles, these are the most durable and they can handle just about any product that's appropriate for tub and tile cleaning, whether it's something that you make or something that you buy. And yes, there are plenty of great store-bought products that you can use. I always like starting off with something simple, something that I make at home. And then if that's not working, like if I were in a professional cleaning situation or I hadn't cleaned my shower in a really long time and the soap scum was really bad, perhaps I'd buy a store-bought product and try something a little bit more powerful. That said, we have amazing DIY recipes and I would always start there first. I'll put a link to our 50 DIY cleaning product recipes down below for you to check out. So for the tub and tile cleaner, it's just equal parts dish soap and vinegar. I would use a half cup of each. You can add 10 drops of your favorite essential oil just to make it a little bit more fun. And the technique that you're using here is you're spraying the product on the tile and you're gonna let it sit for a few minutes five minutes if it's you know a relatively clean shower and if it's sort of dirty you can let it sit for up to 10 minutes the idea here is you don't want to spray it on and let it dry you want to spray it on and let it sit while it's soaking wet so really hose those tiles down a wet product is a product that works now after that time has elapsed you can go in there using a non-scratch scrub pad and use the s pattern to go from top to bottom and scrub those tiles clean what you should see or feel if you can't visually see it is the soap scum starting to come off the way you'll know it's coming off if you're touching it is you'll notice the tiles feel smooth and not that gritty sensation that you would feel if you felt soap scum on there before you started cleaning by the time that's done, you're gonna rinse everything down and then you can buff it dry. Now, there are a few different ways you can buff it dry. You can use a squeegee, but I find after I clean the shower, I think using like a large 
microfiber cloth, like our utility cloth, is a great way just to put that extra polish on a shower. And if you have high tiles like I do, you can actually use a mop, stick the microfiber cloth on there and work your way up and down that way, just to save your arms and your shoulders from doing some extra work. If you're looking for a store-bought cleaning product, you can consider something like a barkeeper's friend, cream cleaners like Vim, something that's a spray on tub and tile cleaner. There are plenty of options out there. Even a steam cleaner is actually great at getting your tiles clean, any type of tile. So there are lots of different options. I'll link some good ones for you down below if you don't wanna make your own. I'm going to treat cement, glass, and natural stone tiles all with the same type of product and tool recommendations because they're much more delicate than your ceramic and porcelain tiles. So we're just gonna use the same products for all of them. Now, as I said, if you have a steam cleaner, that's a perfect thing for you to use. You wanna stay away from anything that's acidic and anything that's abrasive. There are fabulous store-bought products that are specifically designed to melt away soap scum, and I will link those for you down below. And the way that you want to apply them is to follow the package instructions. Everybody's a little bit different, but essentially you're going to put them on the tiles, let them sit for a period of time. You're going to use a non-abrasive scrub pad like the one I was showing you before. You're going to scrub it off and give it a good rinse. Cleaning your oven really is a choose your own adventure type cleaning task because you can dial it up or dial it down as much as you want. In other words, depending on how much effort you want to put in, you can really go full force or you can kind of squeak by. So today I'm just going to be showing you how to clean the cavity of the oven itself. I've got a couple of other reference videos I'll link for you down below on this topic, but a few things I want to point out first and foremost, Cleaning the oven really should happen on a fairly regular basis. I can't tell you, I can't like prescribe an exact amount of time. You'll know based on how frequently you cook and how frequently things bubble over. But essentially when you start to see spills and you know, crusty buildup at the bottom of the oven, it'll eventually cook and cook and cook until it becomes carbonized or like blackened. And then what'll happen is you'll start to get smoke when you're cooking. It'll affect the flavors of your food. You'll kind of think your kitchen's on fire. So that's why it's really important to kind of stay on top of this and make sure that you're cleaning your oven when you start to see and smell those cues. Now, when you're actually in the oven, aside from removing the racks, you want to be really careful that you're not getting product into fans if you have a convection oven or into any of the burners or coils or heating elements that are inside your oven either. You actually wanna be really careful around that because you don't wanna cause any damage. So when you're cleaning the inside cavity, just work your way around that. Now let's talk about in between those two glass panes in the oven door. They are, they are a pain, okay? And the thing is, you can't really clean them. I mean, you can, you will just void your warranty if you do it because You've got to take the door apart and oven manufacturers don't like when we try to do that stuff ourselves. Now you can kind of jimmy rig something where you put paper towel over a fly swatter and stick it up. Fine. If you want to try that, you can. I'm not going to demo that in this video because I don't have time for it. But if you want to try that, you certainly can. Just keep in mind, don't take your oven door apart. You will void the warranty. You'll probably notice here that I have some very simple cleaning products and easy to find household cleaning tools. That's because oven cleaning doesn't have to be complicated and it doesn't have to be harsh. You just have to know what you're doing and have a plan of attack. I'm not a firm believer in using heavy duty oven cleaning chemicals. First of all, I'm not totally comfortable using them. And second of all, I don't want those chemicals in my oven that will then cook food that me and my family will eat. So that's why I like to keep it pretty simple. I'm gonna give you a rundown of the things that I have here uh, so that you can grab them and clean along with me. First and foremost, got some paper towel. I've got microfiber cloth and vinegar. This is for after the fact. We're not using this during the cleaning. I've then got dish soap and baking soda. That's right, I bought it from the bulk food store. Um, that we're gonna be using as our main product for cleaning the oven. I've got a scraper. You can use a windshield scraper, old credit card, or one of these. I'll link it for you down below. Then I've got a Scotch-Brite heavy-duty scrub pad. Love these for this task. And I've, oops, and I've also got some steel wool, which I probably won't use, but it's always good to have on hand in case you need to level up a bit. Oh, and I also have some newspaper, which I'll be putting on the floor. 
to catch all the dirt. Today I'm also going to be cleaning the drawer and the area under the drawer. So I will start by removing everything from the drawer. And this is just good general practice because when you're cleaning your oven, you might get some liquid dripping in. Next up, I'm removing the oven racks as well. You can clean those in the bathtub. I've got that video for you linked below. Now, lining the area with newspaper is a good idea. It just saves you from having to do additional cleanup afterward. Looking inside the cavity of the oven, if you will, you'll see there's quite a bit of buildup in there and some of it's loose and some of it is hardened on, which is why I'm using this scraper to do some cursory cleaning. I wanna get off as much as I can so that I don't actually have to scrub and clean that mess up. So I'm just using a paper towel to do that, wiping it all out. Now I'm making up a solution, four parts baking soda, one part dish soap, one part water. I'll stir it up and you wanna have a nice thick paste. So you can fiddle around with the consistency if you want it a little bit thinner, go for it. I'm just applying it by hand here. I'm sure there's a more eloquent way to do it, but I just felt like going crazy, crazy town. So here I am, I'm putting it on the sides, even on the door, but I have a feeling I'm gonna do the door with Barkeeper's Friend. Now I'm removing that drawer and just using a handheld vacuum to get under because seriously, who is pulling out their oven? And I found a giant spider web, so it was a good thing I did it. Now I'm using a paper towel to wipe out any of the debris and then I'm giving it a good spray because obviously I can't put this in the sink. I'm using a soap filled sponge just to give it a good scrub down. Then I'm going to use a wet microfiber cloth to rinse the interior of this drawer and I can put it off to the side. Little pro tip here is to put a towel down so that your knees don't get sore. Now in that bowl, I've just got some water. I've waited 30 minutes, by the way, to do this. That product has sat for 30 minutes and I'm just starting to scrub. Now you guys will notice I'm using my left hand only. My right shoulder, for those of you who don't know, I dislocated it a while ago, so I actually can't clean with that arm and it is my dominant arm, so my cleaning chops are a little bit suffering right now, but Bear with me. So I'm doing a mix of the scraper and the heavy duty scrub pad, making sure to get the sides, the back, and of course the bottom as well. I'm gonna give this window a good cleaning, but again, I'm just gonna use Barkeeper's Friend because it needs that extra oomph. It took me between five and 10 minutes to scrub inside that oven. And again, I was using my non-dominant hand, so I didn't get the best results. But that's essentially the technique that you're going to use. And now I'm just using water and microfiber cloths to quote unquote rinse the inside of the oven because baking soda leaves a residue behind. I'm gonna finish it up with a vinegar rinse here. So I'm just taking another microfiber cloth and giving everything a final wipe down with some vinegar. That just helps to cut any residual grease and polish things up in there. Now I'm splashing water onto the interior oven window and I'm sprinkling Barkeeper's Friend on there. It's a super powerful product, but you can only use it on the glass in here. I'm using that heavy duty scrub pad to get all of that build up off. It really does take a little bit of effort, well, actually a lot of elbow grease, but it does come off and this window ended, coming, ended up coming out beautifully clean. So here I'm using a microfiber cloth dipped in water to quote unquote rinse it off. You may want to do it once or twice. And you can see that glass is clean. I mean, the interior panels are another story, but the glass itself is very clean. If you're so inclined, you can watch the very old but still applicable video we did years ago about how to clean your self-cleaning oven. I'll link that for you down below, as well as the video teaching you how to clean your oven racks in your bathtub. Also got that linked for you down below. Superfine steel wool is famous for removing rust. So if you have rusty garden tools or hand tools, even rusty scissors or knives, patio furniture, anything that could possibly be rusted, superfine steel wool can easily get that rust off with a few simple buffing motions. All that said, the item that you are buffing cannot be coated or painted because that is a whole other can of worms that we're not getting into today. If you have a shower curtain, you probably have a shower curtain liner as well. It's generally a white or clear 
plastic liner that goes on the inside of the tub and its job is to prevent water from spilling outside the tub while you're in there showering. Now, if your plastic, sh if your shower curtain is plastic or vinyl and your shower curtain liner is plastic or vinyl, both of these items can actually be cleaned by simply placing them in the washing machine with a couple of towels. Now you'll know the frequency of needing to wash these by simply looking at them. If you notice that there's a little bit of mold or mildew, if they're turning kind of gray at the bottom, gray brown, that's soap scum. And if they've got that kind of pinky orangey buildup, don't freak out. That's just a naturally occurring bacteria that lives here in your bathroom. It's typically because it's a really moist environment and that stuff can all come out in the wash. So take everything, take those couple of towels, take your shower curtain and your shower curtain liner, put them into the washing machine, regular cycle. You wanna use cold water here because remember, hot or warm water can actually melt plastic or vinyl, so you wanna avoid that. Also add in um, a full cup of baking soda and you wanna put in 20 drops of tea tree essential oil because tea tree really helps to eliminate mold, mildew, and bacteria. So that way, the towels will scrub in the wash, your stuff will get nice and clean, it'll come out without those stains, hopefully, it really should. And then instead of putting them in the dryer, cause that wouldn't make any sense, you're just gonna hang them right back up on your shower curtain rings and you're gonna let them drip dry into the tub. Now, if your shower curtain is not plastic or vinyl, it might be a fabric that's machine washable, in which case, put it in with that load. If it's dry clean only, then just wash your shower curtain liner as we discussed and take your shower curtain to a dry cleaner. Before we approach cleaning anything, we want to know what it is we're dealing with, whether it's an appliance or a finish or a piece of furniture. Cabinets are no different. You could have a wood cabinet, a laminate cabinet, and then you could, you know, you could have a wood cabinet that's not painted. Then you can have different types of finishes on the cabinet. All of that is going to contribute to how you need to tackle cleaning. Well, I know it sounds easy to grab something like a magic eraser to scrub all of the crap off your cabinets. I want you to stop and think twice. Magic erasers or other abrasive products or cleaning tools like heavy duty sponges or an abrasive cleanser can actually damage the finish of your cabinet, which is something you don't want. You'll have those permanent marks that really won't be able to get rid of. So when we're approaching our cabinets, we wanna make sure that we're not using any abrasive products or tools. And the other thing we wanna stay away from is anything that is a solvent. In other words, anything that can dissolve a finish like paint or varnish, because that's going to lead to an uneven finish on your surface. And frankly, something that is probably difficult or maybe not possible to repair. For the products and tools that you should be using, I always recommend to start with the simplest stuff and work your way up only as needed. That way you're not using anything overly harsh on a surface that could have done just fine with something much more basic. So from a tools standpoint, you wanna have good quality microfiber cloths and a cleaning toothbrush and perhaps a steam cleaner, which I'll cover off in a sec. Now for products, for general cleaning of your surface, you can use our basic all-purpose cleaner, two cups of water, a little squirt of dish soap, or a store-bought all-purpose cleaner that you have hanging around. For grease, you know, stains or fingerprints, you can use something like an enzyme-based cleaner, and I'll link my favorite one for you down below that I think works really well. The reason you wanna use an enzyme cleaner to deal with fingerprints or grease is because enzymes actually digest or break down grease instead of you having to apply something harsh like a solvent or do any thorough scrubbing, which are the two things that we know are going to ruin that finish. So enzyme cleaners are really important. You can also use something like steam to deal with grease, which I can demonstrate for you. And finally, for those points of contact, handles, pulls, doorknobs, et cetera, you can grab a disinfectant and make sure that you're treating those specific areas with a disinfectant. To clean the exterior of your cabinets, you know, if there's like a little stain or mark there, you're just doing a general cleaning. This is how I would approach it. I would take a bottle of all-purpose cleaner and I would spray starting from the top, working my way to the bottom. 
and I'd work section by section. So this entire chunk of cabinets, I would do at once, both the top and the bottom. By the time I've done my spraying and maybe I've done one or two other things, about five minutes will have passed. That will be enough time for the all-purpose cleaner to sort of do its thing, work its way into any dirt, surface marks, etc., And then I can come back and give each cabinet a wipe down with a microfiber cloth using the S pattern, just working my way from the top to the bottom, making sure I get into all of the different grooves. Now, a couple of things you might wanna consider doing if you do have any grooves in your panel or any fancy footwork, I don't know exactly the design term for it, but to get in here every now and then, I'm not saying, you know, 50 times a year, but I'm saying maybe once or twice a year, you can use a cleaning toothbrush just to clean out any dirt, you know, grease, anything that's sort of built up. When I do heavy duty move in, move out cleans, that's often something that makes a really big difference. Kitchen cabinets also feature one of our favorite topics of late, points of contact. So what you would want to consider as well is to simply spray this area with a disinfectant, or you can use a disinfecting wipe to give it a wipe down for a couple of seconds to scrub, not a couple of seconds. So you have to follow package instructions to make sure that you're getting the maximum benefit from your disinfecting product, whatever it may be. Uh, or you can treat it with some rubbing alcohol. But again, you have to be mindful of the type of finish and make sure that whatever disinfecting product you're using is safe for the particular finish that you have. I'd say the most difficult thing to clean off of a cabinet is grease, whether it's a greasy fingerprint or greasy splatter that's built up over time, that is going to be your biggest challenge. What you can use is an enzyme cleaner. I mentioned this earlier. I'm gonna give you a link to my favorite one down below. We also have a video on enzyme cleaners and if you're curious, you can check that out. But you wanna spray the enzyme cleaner on the surface and you wanna get it very wet. It should be dripping wet. Enzyme cleaners only work if the surface is wet for a few minutes, typically two to five minutes. Once that's done, you can then take your microfiber cloth and wipe. The lovely thing about enzyme cleaners is you really don't have to do any scrubbing. The product does the heavy lifting for you. And by the time the product has been wiped off, your grease should be gone. Now, if you have a steam cleaner handy, steam is really a great way to get rid of grease. So you would just load up your steamer with water, you'd plug it in, you would use the appropriate tool, nothing with scrubbing. You would just wanna aim straight steam over the stain itself you can spray it on the surface and then have a cloth handy to wipe up any residual moisture or liquid, the cabinets are gonna look great. Steam is very easy, but you do need to have a steam cleaner, so the choice is yours. To clean the interior of your cabinets, it's pretty straightforward. In fact, you can use any of the products that we've already talked about to tackle the exact same issues inside. I will say if you have a steam cleaner, it is really easy to just blast some steam in there and give everything a good wipe. One thing I will recommend, particularly if it's a pantry or somewhere where there are lots of crackers and chips and nuts, you know where this is going, is to remove everything and then give it a really good vacuum using a vacuum with a brush attachment or even a little handheld broom just to sweep all of the schmutz out of there before you start wiping down. You might also notice that there are some stains or some slide marks from you know repeated motions of you like sliding cans out. If you do see that, something you might wanna consider is using some shelf liner. It's pretty inexpensive. And the nice thing is, is it preserves the surface inside your cabinet. And you can get kind of fancy with it and get you know pretty prints. You have fun with it, whatever you want. Now the final thing I'll tell you about the interior cabinets is if you notice they're a little bit smelly, quick fix, just put a box of baking soda in there. It's actually a great trick for, you know, your spice cupboard or any area where you're storing anything that you know it might, might have a bit of an off smell. It's such an easy, inexpensive fix and it works like a charm. If you notice that your bedroom has a bit of a off-putting smell to it, all signs are gonna point to the bed. Well, most of the time. You see your sheets, are kind of like the clothing that your mattress wears. And when you sleep, you sweat in your sheets and sweat over time builds up odors in your sheets and that's what smells. That's why your sheets kind of smell stuffy. Now, if you're not laundering your sheets on a regular basis, which means every week to two weeks, that's your window, your room is really gonna start to smell. And over time, your mattress is going to absorb that odor. That right off the top, one thing you can change right away. 
After stripping your bed and throwing your sheets in the wash, rather than just remaking your bed immediately with a new set of sheets, open the windows, weather permitting, and let your mattress breathe. It needs time to just air out, kind of like a fine wine. Let it do its thing. Because all of the time that your mattress is made up, it doesn't have the opportunity for air to circulate and to naturally freshen it up. But when your window is open and the fresh air is blowing in, it actually makes a big difference in helping to deodorize and refresh your mattress. Let's say you're watching this video and you have an old stain on your mattress. If it's not bothering you, aside from the fact that it's an eyesore, I would just say to leave it. And here is why. Mattresses and moisture don't get along. So once your mattress gets some moisture in it, it really has nowhere to go. And that's where the concern about mold buildup in a mattress comes from. Now, if you have a fresh stain on your mattress, you wanna hop on that as quickly as you can. So as soon as something spills, you wanna blot it up like crazy. So get a super absorbent cloth, blot, blot, blot. And you want your stain to be as dry as possible. The more moisture you can remove off the surface, the less will seep into your mattress and just sit there over time. Once that's done, you can then assess the surface stain like the way it looks and see if you actually want to tackle it and a product that i think would do really well would be an enzyme cleaner they're really great at breaking stains down of course it'll be entirely dependent on the type of stain that it is but when you treat the stain you want to use as little product as possible you can use a cleaning toothbrush just to kind of scrub it in and work it in really well and then rather than pouring water on there to flush the stain you actually want to use a damp cloth to try and remove as much of the suds as possible so that way you're not adding more moisture to the situation i know i said the m word a lot i know a lot of people don't like that but sometimes you just gotta say it so let's rewind a bit you've stripped your mattress you're washing your sheets what should you do now i would recommend getting a vacuum with an upholstery brush attachment and a crevice tool and you're going to use that to do a surface vacuum. Now you might not visibly see any dirt or dust on there, but this step makes a big difference because it's removing everything that's just surfacey, kind of sitting on top of your mattress that you can't see. So you'll take your vacuum, you'll work from top to bottom, left to right. You're gonna use that crevice tool if you have a pillow top and you've got some bumps that you need to get into and you wanna give it a good vacuum and then you're gonna just let it air out. By doing that, you're removing a lot of those dead skin cells, dust mite, anything that basically is gonna make you sneeze or make your mattress smelly. That's the whole point of doing the vacuum. Deodorizing your mattress. There are lots of techniques floating around on the internet. In fact, we did a video on this years ago and we talked about sprinkling baking soda on your mattress. And that does work because baking soda is pretty amazing at absorbing odors. But I wanna change things up a little bit just to make sure that you're doing it correctly. And the way that I like to do it to get a nice consistent sprinkle is to sift it on. Once that's done, you're gonna let it sit for 30 minutes and then you're gonna vacuum it up using a shop vac, not your $1,000 brand new vacuum because baking soda over time can actually affect the quality of the motor. So you wanna make sure that you're using a vacuum that can handle a fine powder like baking soda. And then of course you wanna make sure that you're using a clean upholstery brush. Now there are some other articles that are out there talking about adding vinegar and water to a spray bottle in equal parts and spritzing that on your mattress and letting it air dry. Here's the thing. I don't think vinegar and water is really going to fix what's going on on a mattress. Frankly, I think more than anything, airing it out well, staying on top of washing your sheets is actually the best way to go. There are those times where you'll want to bring in a professional. Steam cleaning, deep cleaning, and bed bug cleaning are things that should be done by a pro. End point. Sometimes I'll read these articles online and they almost have this like fear mongering aspect to them where they make you feel like your toilet bowl brush is just full of disgusting things. And listen, it's no picnic. It's not a nice thing to think about. It, it is kind of gross. I mean, think about the job that it does, but at the same time, it's not like it's this disgusting bacterial infested thing that you should, you know, never be touching. And it, it, it's fine. It's fine. It's not going to kill you. 
But the thing is, a toilet bowl brush does have to be taken care of properly so that it can last and so that it isn't full of all that bacteria that you might think it is. So here are a few rules about using your toilet bowl brush. The first thing is to make sure that whenever you're using it, you're using it with a cleaning product. That way, obviously the bowl is getting cleaned, but the brush can be cleaned too toward the end. So if you wanna make sure that your brush is being cleaned and you don't wanna take the time to clean it yourself, finish doing your cleaning of the toilet, squirt a little bit of product on it. You can take an edge of the bowl and give your brush a tiny little scrub, then flush, give your brush a rinse while the toilet bowl is flushing, and then do the famous clean my space trip trick and drip dry your toilet bowl brush. Now toilet bowl brushes obviously are made from plastic, so throwing them out and replacing them with a new one isn't the best thing given the environmental situation. So the longer we can keep our plastic toilet bowl brushes clean and functional, the better. If you want a timeline, I'd say inspect yours once a year. And if it looks kind of grungy, at that point you can replace it. But if it's still working and it looks pretty clean, it's probably fine. It doesn't take a global pandemic for your pillow to gain weight like the rest of us. Your pillow just naturally gains weight because each and every night, it's, absorb it's absorbing, you see how excited I got there? Dust, dead skin cells, pet dander, body oils, sweat, and essentially anything else that's floating around in your room in some way, shape, or form will eventually land on the pillow and get absorbed in. Your pillow is like a sponge on your bed. When we talk about sleep hygiene, especially for me, I've really been struggling with sleep lately. Every little thing has to be just so in order for me to get a good night's sleep. And any health practitioner that you talk to, chiropractor, osteopath, anyone who works on the bod is going to be able to tell you how important it is to have a good quality pillow so that you can get a good night's sleep. And part of that is taking good care of it and making sure it's clean. And also knowing when it's a little too ripe for use. I remember when I was growing up, I had a pillow that just got progressively more flat and it felt good, I guess, but I didn't really know the beauty of having a loftier pillow. A couple things you wanna look out for that will tell you when your pillow is kind of past the point of no return. Depending on the type of material you have in your pillow, if it's sort of clumpy and the clumps cannot be broken up, that might be a good indicator for you. If it's discolored or stained and mm -hmm, then maybe you can get rid of it as well. The best way though you can test a pillow to see if it's still worth its salt is by doing the fold in half test. I wish there was a more progressive name for it like the Neuschenstocker test, but there's not. You just fold it in half and if it springs back, it's good to go. And then look at this disgusting, yeah, I'm, ugh, this is not mine, okay? This belongs to someone else. But if you see this pillow here, it struggles to flip back. That tells us that this pillow is kind of past the point of no return. And that's really how you know. You kind of do the look test, the smell test, the feel test, but the folding in half test is the one that's gonna tell you if your pillow is worth keeping or not. And the life cycle of an average pillow, oh, I'm gonna move my foot off the bed because I know lots of you freaked out about that last time I did that. Average lifespan of a pillow is about two years. As with anything you are ever going to wash in your life, it is always important to understand the material and the wash instructions or the care label, which you should have. You know, you get like those long CVS style receipt like tags on your pillow, <laughs> generally right beside those. It'll tell you how to wash and care for your pillow. Now there are generally four different types, four or five different types of fillers that you'll see in pillows, feather pillows, gel pillows, memory foam pillows, and silk pillows. There's also synthetics, which is I think what this is. What you need to know first and foremost is the material. And sometimes you're not even gonna be allowed to machine wash your pillow, which is why it's so important to check first. If you have a memory foam or a gel pillow or a silk pillow, you cannot machine wash them. You will have to follow separate instructions. For a feather pillow or for a synthetic pillow like this, let's get into the general washing instructions. So if you have a nasty looking pillow like this with yellow stains, first thing you can do is treat them with a stain remover. And you can use something that's gentle, but really effective. And basically what this is, it's body oils and sweat. That's what those coffee looking stains are. I just wanna make a quick note here. Even if you have a pillowcase over time, just from your cheek, your hair being on the pillow, you're gonna see this. I mean, I can feel it and you can really tell that it's kinda 
soiled. So I think a stain remover treatment on something that looks like this would be ideal. Just give it a spritz and then put it in the washing machine. Now, if you have a top load washing machine with an agitator, which is that central bar that kind of turns everything around, you will need to wash your pillows in pairs. That way you're not putting an uneven load on one side of your machine or another. If you have a front load or top load machine with no agitator, pop in as little or as many as you can safely fit in. You'll wanna use gentle detergent, ideally scent-free. I prefer scent-free for something like this because you're gonna be sleeping on the pillow and you don't want that scent to kind of overwhelm you as you're trying to go to bed. Next, you can use warm water when you're doing this. This is, again, general instructions. I'll just remind you to check your care label and just make sure warm water is safe. You're gonna run it through on a regular cycle and then you're gonna throw in an extra spin cycle. It will just help to spin out any extra moisture which is gonna make drier time a lot shorter. And that's where things can get really tricky with pillows. Now, once it comes out of the washing machine, all good, you're gonna move them over to the dryer. Put every single dryer ball you have on your property in the dryer. It's gonna be really important to get these dry and even and to get the lumps out. If you don't have dryer balls, you can take tennis balls and stick them in sports socks and just tie them. Now, you don't want a wet pillow. That is where mold can start to grow. So it's crucial that your pillow is entirely dry so when you take your pillow out of the machine the first time, I'm not going to demo on that one, what you'll do is you'll hold it up to your face and you're going to breathe in, okay? And if you breathe in and you sense moisture in your mouth and in your, in your trachea, then you know you have to put it back in the machine. But if you breathe it in and it feels nice and crisp and clear, great, your pillow is done, it's dry, you're good to go. If you notice that your pillow is a little bit smelly, you can add half a cup of baking soda to your washing machine while it is running through, and that will just help break down any additional odors. Another thing to think about, you know, when you watch like a home TV show and they're like fluffing pillows, that is not just for aesthetic purposes. When uh, you have a pillow and you sleep on it all night, you kind of create a groove. And if you fluff up your pillow, you're actually redistributing the law, meaning your pillow will feel good and last longer. I also want you to keep in mind, and I used to do this so much when I was younger, but I know how much of a no-no it is now. Don't go to bed with a wet head. I know sometimes it's a cool kind of hairstyle hack that you can do where you sleep with like wet braids, but what you're actually doing is you're putting moisture into your pillow, which creates mold, and that's where you get some of that staining from that I was showing you earlier. And in our last video, we got a lovely comment, obviously something that would never cross my mind living in this freezing Canadian climate as I look out my window at a snowstorm right now. It was from a viewer in the Caribbean who said that when she uh, is taking care of her pillows, she likes to use two clips and hang them off the balcony and let the sun just stream in. And that helps, as we know, to deodorize and also lighten any fabric. So, hey, if you have some sunshine, go for it. Using a pillow protector is crucial. I say this to you as I show you my dirty, dirty shams here. These are not actually the pillows we sleep on. So we actually don't have pillow protectors on these ones. The ones we sleep on, we do. But those are important because they protect the pillow itself from all of that stuff I was telling you about at the beginning of the video. So when you go to launder your pillow case, you can actually remove your pillow protector and wash that as well and that will not only act as a moisture barrier but as a dust barrier and a barrier from pretty much any other thing you don't want getting into your pillow the sink is something that's so easy to keep clean but it can be kind of inconvenient, especially if you're rushing around doing a bunch of other things in the kitchen. You see, when I rinse out a bowl in the sink or something like that, I don't actually want to clean the sink as well. It's like, I want to clean the bowl and then I want to move on with my life. However, if you do that 20 times throughout the course of a day, your sink is going to be gross. So if you want to have a really nice sparkling clean kitchen, it's important to focus on that sink. The good news about a sink is that it's actually quite easy to clean and make look beautiful. If you have some baking soda handy, Sprinkle that into your sink, if nothing else, just some baking soda and a sponge and like 45 seconds of your time will get it polished up and clean. Give it a good scrub, give it a rinse, grab a microfiber cloth and shine it, you're done. And your sink looks amazing. Well, congratulations to you because you just made it through 40 minutes of video teaching you how to clean some of the toughest areas in your home. And that brings me to this week's comment question, which is, 
what are some of the biggest cleaning challenges that you are currently facing? Let me know in the comments down below because that is what gives us ideas to help create better content for you. So anything that you write down there really helps steer the Clean My Space ship. If you'd like even more cleaning help and motivation, you can check out this playlist right over here. And if you're looking for a couple of other ways to support or join the Clean My Space channel, you can of course do so by subscribing and you can visit Makers Clean, which is where we sell all of our premium microfiber cleaning tools and more. Thanks so much for watching and we'll see you next time.